In this presentation, I will be talking about describing new species of fish. And new species of fish, I will show you uh, immediately. Are there are many more than we already know. So we have every week new species of fish to describe. And I call this talk describing new species of fishes because the way we describe new species varies among groups. So when you describe fish, we do it in one way. When you describe spiders, we do it in a different way. And but this is basically tradition. Many things are in common among all groups but the tradition of certain taxonomic groups vary. Okay, so how to describe a new species of fish? Uh, in this talk, I will first um, briefly talk about what is a species and what is a new species. And then most of my talk will be on how to prepare an article to describe a new species of fish. And I'll give you examples and of everything and I will, I'll, only use examples from my papers, from my descriptions of fishes. <clears throat> so I'll not use uh, data from any other authors that, so no copyright problems. Okay, so what is a species? Many species concepts have been proposed and used in the past decades. And these many different concepts come from different threats of, bi of biology of the species from, from different and groups, and we have uh, uh, probably dozens of species concepts. More recently, in the last two or three decades, two decades, I'll say, species concepts have converged to ideas of lineage. So a lineage of population is the species. And Kevin de Quiroz presented in 2007, this unified species concept, as he called, where he said the species are independently evolving metapopulation lineages. In summary, a species is one, a single lineage of populations. So let's take a look at this graph. A, a population is a group of individuals that reproduce and live in an area, in area A1 from time one to time two. This population will reproduce and leave a next generation that will be in the same area in, in, in the next time. With the time, this population will, you know, produce many populations along the time. But as long as this is a single lineage of population, it is a species. So it's one single lineage of evolving uh, population. Uh, things can happen. Uh, this population or the this, this, this species can shrink its area and ev eventually become extinct, or it can disperse to another area, or it can expand the area. It doesn't matter. As long as it's a single evolving lineage, it's the same species. It's one and the same species. So when it stops being a species, or when it when it gets extinct or for some type of barrier, it becomes two separate lineages. Can be a physical barrier, a cli climatic barrier or any type of barrier that splits that single lineage in two separate evolving lineages. And then you can think, well, it becomes a species immediately after separation time three Maybe one, when one brother is in one side of the barrier and his brother is in the other side. Well, theoretically, yes. The, the separate evolving lineages will be separate species. So we'll have a species B and C as descendant species from a species A. But in practice, we only can tell there are different species when different phenotypic difference or genetic differences, but when the difference start to appear then we can, we can a tool to tell their different lineages. Okay, so let's take a look at some corollaries that come from, from this idea of species. All organisms, past and present, all of them, belong to some evolutionary lineage. Species must be reproductively isolated from others 
to the extent required to keep their identities, trends, and historical fate. It doesn't mean that species have to be completely reproductively isolated. No, they can uh, reproduce with other close by species and even have a fertile offspring. These are hybrids. Uh, evolutionary lineages may or may not exhibit recognizable phenotypic differences, but they are separate lineages. Maybe we cannot tell them, but they are separate lineages. And also that no single evolutionary lineage can be subdivided into a series of ancestral descendant species. So as long as it's one lineage, we cannot tell that it was one species at the beginning and other species at the end. It's all the same species. Okay, so what is a species in practice, in our everyday practice as taxonomists? A species is a hypothesis we make about the existence of an independent lineage. So when we have specimens at hand, we have for using some uh, biological tools to make the hypothesis that they represent an independent lineage. In, in the everyday practice, in the, in the lab, in our practice, a species is what a taxonomist can distinguish and tell others how to distinguish. This is the very practice. But what does in boldface tell others how to distinguish is the most important part. Because if we can distinguish a species, but we cannot tell others how to distinguish, I don't believe it's a, a different species. But if you can write a diagnosis or make a key to, to distinguish the species, then we can, we can have a separate lineage. Right, and then what is a new species? Well, a new species is a species or a lineage that was not yet discovered and properly described. And there are many, but how many? I'll give you an example from South America. And I know that this is probably the same in Asia, in much more than this in Africa, for instance. But in 2000, 2003, Svenkulander, Kaufferarz, and I produced this book. This is a this thick book, is a checklist of the freshwater fish of South and Central America. At that time, we listed 4,475 species as valid species for Central and South America. And you estimated, based on, 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 based on what you knew, based on the more than 40 authors we have in the book, that the final number of freshwater fishes for South and Central America will be a, a little above 6,000 species. And, and note that 2003 was only 18 years ago. Well, in these 18 years, we have described an average of 104 new species per year. That means one new species every 3.5 days, two species a week is what we have been described in South and Central America. So after 18 years, in 2021, we have already described 1,725 new species. That's more than one fourth of all species in this region. And now we have 6,200 species. That's more than the, the est what was estimated in 2003, only in 18 years. So current estimates is that we have in South America 9,000 species. So about one third still have to be discovered and described. Okay, so this is what we're talking about, how to describe this species. So most of my talk now will be about how to prepare an article to describe a new species of fish. So which are the different parts of a typical article prepared to describe a new species of fish? I've been working the last several years as editors of journals that, that um, publish new species of fish. I, I work as an editor in Neotropical Ichthyology for a long time. And then in Copia, by the way, now it's called Ichthyology and Herpetology for maybe 12 years now. And in the last years, maybe four or five years, I'm editor at PLOS One. 
And most of the articles that I edit and I work as editor are describing species or are basically taxonomic work on fish. And many of them describe new species of fish. Okay, so which are the parts of an article? Let's dissect an article. And let's begin by the title. So the title, title must be concise and informative. Tell to your readers the fish group, the fish genus or the group, uh, a brief classification, usually use order and family, the region where the new species come from, and any other remarkable aspect of your article. Like this, for example, a new species of the armored catfish Otocinclus. So I'm, I'm using a, a common name, armored catfish, the name of the genus, author of the genus, and a classification, Siluriformis loricaridae, and, and the region from the Eastern Amazon River, Brazil. But there are other examples. Some, some journals accept the new name in the title, some don't. So in this case, Porto Cinclus Iaca, new species of armor catfish, Loricaridae, Hypopiformatinae, from the Amazon basin. Or a new species of Pseudobunocephalus from the lower Tocantins and Main River drainages, north and northeastern Brazil. Or in this case, new species of Curculi unictus from the western border of the Brazilian Shield, Madeira River Basin, Brazil. So I'm now introducing ge the geology. The fish come from the western border of the Brazilian Shield. It's a big geological formation in South America. Or I can, I can add already in the title characteristics of the genus, like a new species of the blind miniature genus Micromycin from the Orinoco River. And then a relevant aspect of the study describing catfish diversity using high resolution computed tomography. Or we can describe more than one species in a paper like this, an expected high diversity in a small basin, taxonomic revision of Eurocalyptus with description of seven new species. Okay, enough of title. So introduction. In this section, introduce a new species to your reader, to which genus it belongs, which is the distribution of the genus, which is the history of the genus. Tell your story, who collected the specimens, when, under which project. And at the end, mention your objective, that in this case is to describe a new species. Then material and methods. In this section, tell the reader all details that allow him to reproduce your study. How did you measure and count your specimens? How did you clear and stain your specimens for studying bones and cartilage? Which are the collections you use to examine comparative specimens? You'll see at the end that this is very important. Where are the type specimens of the new species in which collection? Which statistics and tests you use to demonstrate your species is a lineage separated from others? Which molecular techniques you used, if any, and for what purpose? Which other techniques you employed, like CT scan, X-ray, uh, electron uh, micrography, scanning electron micrography, geometric morphometrics, photography, etc.? What you used? Which equipment and software were used? So all these details must be in the material methods section, so anyone can reproduce your data, your, your results. Then come results. And Results in an article describing a species, results is basically the species account, is where you describe the species itself. So it usually starts with the name of the species, followed by new species, or NSP for, or, for English, or SPN or SPNOV in Latin for species novae. Then when you use a new species after the name, there you're proposing the name. And this and headings, you should also see the figure of the holotype and add the ZooBank LSID number is, is a code, the registration of your species in ZooBank. And if, if there are some, you can put there the synonymy of the ways this new species have been already cited by other articles. It's not very common, but I'll show you some examples. Like in this case, Puerto Cinclus Iaca, new species, then the ZooBank registration number, Fig one remits to, this, to the holotype figure. And 
one uh, synonymy, Partosinclus polyocrus, but not Schaefer, but Lima, 2005. He, Lima identified that new species in the past as Partosinclus polyocrus, so it's good to mention here. Or in this case, Pseudobunocephalus timbira, new species, figures, tables, Zobank, LSID, and a synonymy. In this case, Corcleonictus sky is a new species. We don't have a synonymy for this species, but Zobank and figure tables. Or in this case, we have two synonymous. Lundberg just cited it as undescribed hoplomycin, and then Fry and Lundberg as anophthalmic hoplomycin. So it's good to mention that when you describe the new species. So you link those best articles to your name. Okay, then comes type material. Type material is a section that must be written very carefully. So here we choose the holotype and the paratypes. Holotype is the name bearer, is the most important of the types. Is that single specimen can be a male or a female that will hold the name. The name will be always attached to the holotype. And paratypes are by definition all other specimens that were used in the description. So uh, any other specimen that they use and you refer to the new species will be paratypes. Unless you uh, say uh, specimens X and Y are not paratypes. You usually do that when specimens are not well preserved or are not from very near the type locality. Maybe we're not quite sure it belongs to that species. So you can list it as known types. And if you can also add gene sex. Gene sex are simply genetic sequences of a gene that you deposit in gene bank. And you have gene sec one, two, three, and four. Gene sec one are sequences derived from the holotype. Gene sec two from paratypes. Gene sec three from other specimens from the type locality. And gene sec four sequences for any other species that you attribute to that species. All right. And scene types are a type of, of type specimens that. Uh, when uh, that are, I don't recommend using syntypes, but the, the International Code of Zoological Nomenclature today allows to use syntypes. But I don't recommend because all, all type series will have the same status of name bearer. So if you have a mix, you have different species mixing your specimens, there will be a confusion. Then you'll have to choose one later as a lectotype. So choose a holotype and let the remaining ones be paratypes. That's the best action. And like this. So when listing the holotype, give the museum and catalog number, the size, the sex, and the detailed locality, including geographic coordinates, date, and collector. For paratypes, do the same. In this case, all are collected with the holotype and then some ginseng. OK, after that, come diagnosis. Diagnosis is the most important part of the article describing new species. The diagnosis should distinguish the new species from all other species in the genus. I will say start your study by writing the diagnosis. When you think you have a new species, a new species, write a diagnosis. That's the most important part. If you can write the diagnosis, remember the definition, the practical definition of species. Species is what a taxonomist and distinguish it and tell others how to distinguish. So write a diagnosis. If you can write a diagnosis and show your colleagues and they can test your diagnosis and, and using it, distinguish your specimens or your new species from any other species in that genus, then you have a good diagnosis. Well, a diagnosis, and I will give you some examples, but the important is that you have to examine specimens of other species to write your diagnosis. In, in writing the diagnosis, usually and ideally mention a few characters, one or a few characters that distinguish the new species from all other or from many, as many as possible species at the same time, always giving the alternate state using verses. I'll show you some examples. Uh, a combination of characters type of diagnosis is not good. It's the weakest possible type. Combination of characters that diagnosis that say, well, the new species distinguished by 
A, B, and C characters in combination from all others, all other species. This is usually very quick because you have to test the three characters in all other species at the same time to see if it's, if, if it's different. So it doesn't work properly. So I, don't worry, I won't read all that text. I just want to show you the beginning. So in this case, Ricolitis castanius is distinguished from all congeners except Limulus by possessing a plain body da, 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 versus body and head with different combination of their blotches. Then it follows. It is distinguished from Limulus, that species that was accepted here, by having this and that versus, and then so on. And then you can give other characteristics that distinguish the new species from some others. But at the beginning, try to distinguish the new species from all species or from as many as possible. Whereas in this case, Bartosinclus yaca is distinguished from its congeners from northeastern and southern Brazilian rivers, and, and you list them, all of them, in having the cheek canal plate elongated posteriorly on the ventral surface of the head and contacting the control, versus canal plate rounded. Then Iaka is distinguished from all other congeners from the Amazon or Inoco and Guianas by having this and that, right? Okay, description. Description is the most formal part of a species description. It's a text where you carefully describe the specimens you have. So describe the holotype and the paratypes, emphasizing the variation you have. Start on the head, snout, head, eyes, and then proceed to the body and fins. Always use telegraphic style in the description. All description, description of color in alcohol color, live color, or osteology, we always use telegraphic style. What is telegraphic style, Zachary? This is a problem is very common not to follow or not to follow a full telegraphic style that should be followed. An example, look at this text. The proportional measurements and counts are presented in tables one, three, and four. The dorsal body profile is gently arced from the snout tip to the posterior process of the parietal suprocipital. It is a stride to slightly concave from that point to the origin of the dorsal fin, and so on. So to make, make this, this is a, a current, a, a normal speaking text, you know, it's a telephonic text instead of, instead of telegraphic. But how you, you, you make this a telegraphic style? First, remove all articles. So D, A, M must be removed, your articles. Then all verbs are presented is, is, are, we don't use verbs. And we can rearrange some words to make it more fluid. Like instead of saying the posterior process of the, of the parietal suprocipital, I can say parietal suprocipital posterior process or the origin of the dorsal fin, just dorsal origin and so on. So this is the text, the same text in telegraphic style. The proportional measurement and counts in table one, three and four. No, no articles. Dorsal body profile gently arched from snout tip to parietal suprocipital posterior process. Stride to slightly concave from that point to dorsal fin origin. So if you practice, you'll be able to write in telegraphic style quite easily. Right, then call life. In this section, carefully describe the color of specimens you have. Describe the variation you see in paratypes. Use stripes for longitudinal lines on body or fence, use bars for transverse marks on body, and use bands for transverse marks on fence, and add one or more figures of a living specimen if possible. So what I wrote here is usually what people con conf make confusions in descriptions. I use uh, bars for, for fins or bands for body, or sometimes people, uh, uh, Right, uh, vertical stripes, but stripes are always horizontal. Right. Color in alcohol or in preservative. So describe the color pattern that remain in preservative. Mention which vivid colors were lost with preservation. And cite figures of preserved specimens, preferably holotype. Here is a good place also to cite the holotype or even other specimens. I'll show you examples later. Sexual dimorphism. Describe the difference found between males and females and include those on morphology, size, 
color, behavior, etc. Everything you find different between males and females and illustrate if possible. Distribution. Briefly describe the distribution of the type material. Sit in river basin, main drainage, and depending on the range, state and countries. Add a figure with the map. map maps are very, very good for species description. Habitat and ecology. Describe what is known of the habitat where the type material was collected. So tell about the water type, the bottom, if, if, is it stone, sand, mud, marginal vegetation, amount, type, um, site water parameters if you have, like transparency, current speed, dissolving oxygen, temperature, conductivity, etc. List other species collected syntopically, you know, which other species was, were collected with the type material. Add one or more photos of the habitat. Conservation assessment. This is something that began in the last decade. In the last decade, it's very common to see a preliminary concept, conservation assessment in, in species description. I say preliminary because IUCN will, will make the, the, the final definitive. But make a preliminary extinction risk assessment of the new species and use always use the criteria and categories of IUCN. Etymology, explaining etymology, how you compose the new name. Always use Latin or Latinized words. Explain the origin of each part of the name, like in this case. The specific epithet, epithet is the second word of the binome. So specific epithet of Eucalyptus paucidens is from the Latin paucus, meaning few, little, and dense, meaning tooth, in allusion to the small number of accessory teeth in both premaxilla and dentary. And then add an adjective. This, in this case, an adjective. It, the name could also be an, a noun in a position. Okay, and but the, how we give name to the new species? You usually use three ways to give names, or what is most common, we use an organismal feature. So, like the Eurycleitus paucidens, I do, just told you, paucidens, few tooth. Or gymnogaster, as gymnos is a naked, gaster is belly, so it has no plates in the belly. Oh, hypossumus rosio punctatus, it has pink punctuations, so rosio punctatus. Or you can use the distribution to give name to a species, like Leptocinclus madeira from the Madeira River, Pyrophis mucurina from the Mucuri River, or hypossumus uruguayensis from Uruguay. Or Another option is to honor somebody when you give a name. So you add the, you use the name, usually the surname, as you can use the first name. The name plus an I, it's, if it's a man, an AE, if it's a woman, or Orum, if you honor more than one people at the same time. Like in this, this example, the Sturisoma is very I, and honor to Richard Vary, or Hypossumus is Brooker I, in honor to Isaac is Brooker. To men, or is to resume a reine and honor to Ruth Reina, that's a woman, or Eurycalyptus Louise, in honor to Louisa Reyes, my daughter. <laughs> I never described the species to more than one people at the time to use orum, so I borrowed this example from Cope, 1894. I give Astienex Eigemani orum in honor to the couple Eigemann, Carl and Rosa Eigemann. So Eigemani orum. All right, then the discussion. And the discussion typically compare your results with those of previous authors. Discuss your findings and how they impact the taxonomy of the group. Discuss any remarkable aspect of your study and conclude mentioning why this is still needed in that particular fish group, All right? Comparative material. Comparative material examined. That means list what you examined list every specimen you examine to compare your new species. Here, basically you demonstrate that you examine an extensive material of other species of the same genus. And you compare your new, your, your hypothesis of a new species, of a new lineage with the remaining species. So list catalog number, number of specimens, preparation, if it's an alcohol, is a skeleton, is an x-ray, and locality. But don't worry about date and collectors, you usually only use data and collector for type material. The quality, yes, with details. It's expected that you examine specimens of all or most other species in the genus of the new species. 
Acknowledgements, so further typical acknowledgements, say thanks to institutions and curators that lent or gave you specimens and be grateful to collectors and other few helpers who are not authors. And references, well, depending on the journal, species authorities, the authors of species should be cited as references, but this is not very common, but some journals would like that. Otherwise follow the journal citation style. Okay, and then I'll, I'll give you example of tables and figures using the species description. So different types of tables should be used to present data of the new species and take care never to repeat in text what you're saying in tables. So this is a typical table uh, of the species description. We give a standard length and you give the standard length say is in millimeters for the holotype and the range minimum and maximum for the paratypes. All other measurements we present as percent of standard length or percent of the head length. And then we give that percentage to the holotype and not only to the paratypes here, these are everything, see, range includes the holotype. So the range includes the holotype. So this is the range for these species, minimum and maximum, mean and standard deviation. Standard deviation is good because when you have a high number, like more than two here, or more than two here, 2.95 here, you can go back to your data and check if you measured correctly. Yeah. In this case, yeah, it's correct. But sometimes you see, well, eight something. Wow, must be, a, must be an error there, right? This is the same type of table, but for four species together. So you can compare them. And these numbers in bold face here, are proportions that distinguish these species from the others. Counts, meristic data, you can give in tables like this one. So number of premaxillary and dentary teeth, plates, branched, fin rays, you give data for holotype and the same, the range for all the specimens. Or you can give in this way, some more informative. Then you have many species here. And for instance, Teeth and premaxilla, they vary from 10 to 20, 26. And you give the number of specimens with each count. And underline is the holotype. So this is very informative. And figures. I'll end with the figures. So illustrate the holotype in dorsal, lateral, and ventral views if possible, if necessary. Some fish are very flat, so a lateral view doesn't help much. Illustrate a living or freshly killed specimen for a live color. Illustrate specific structures you mentioned in the description or the diagnosis to help the reader to identify what you're talking about. Illustrate the habitat. Give a map for the species distribution. And add all graphs and, and plots, figures to make clear the difference to other species. So I'll give you some examples from my, my description. So this is a typical lateral dorsal and ventral view of a holotype, but this is black and white. Look, that color is a very important feature. So if you can publish in color, it's a lot more information. Yeah. So try always to publish the, the fish figures in color, like this or this. And this fish that are more three-dimensional, dorsal, lateral, and ventral view are important. This is tiny figure, 15 millimeters of micromycin and here's the holotype and oops right here's the holotype in dorsal ventral view and a clear in the stained specimen so you can see the skeleton which very useful as well you can put pictures of preserved male and females together in alcohol and in color here so you can see differences between males and females also. Or you can make a plate with a holotype preserved and males and females unpreserved, live color. Or you can use the holotype at the collection time and today in the collection. This is the same specimen, look who's lost color with the ears. So it's very good to have photographs uh, in the field. You can make plates with many species at the same time to be easily compared. And you can make pick plates with specimens from small to large. So you can compare them to genetic changes in color. You should also illustrate structures 
parts of the fish, parts of the bones of anything that you, you present in the description or diagnosis to help the reader to understand what you mean. So an arrow will help in that case. The same with photographs. And don't, don't save on pictures. Pictures are very good. A picture worth a thousand words. So use pictures to demonstrate what you're describing. It makes a, a good difference. You can use x-rays to show skeleton, or you can use high resolution CT scan. This is that fish with 15 millimeters. See how detailed, how, how many details you can show in, in, in the skull using CT scan. You see, it's a very small fish and you can see a lot. Also illustrate a habitat where the specimens were collected. The habitat give us a good idea or where, where to look for the fish if you want to collect some, if you need to collect some for further study. So illustrating a habitat is usually very important and illustrative. This is an interesting case. This is the same place in low water season and high water season. So it's a big, big difference. Maps, you can use this usual type of line drawing maps, black and white, and you can use different symbols. You can use a different symbol um, like here to show holotype and other paratypes, but the holotype, the type locality here is a star. In this other case, I use the T to show the type locality. So you distinguish which is the type locality. So this white square species occurs in all this area here, but the type is there, type locality is there, the holotype locality is there. Or you can use this computer generated maps, which are more beautiful, more visual, and very easy to generate these days. The important thing is to use map. Maps always give us a, a good idea of the distribution, of the localization of the basin and the continent. So maps are always very good for species description. And finally, use graphs. Use graphs to demonstrate the statistics used to separate those species or box plots, any type of, of graph that will help to, to see and understand the differences between the new species and the other species in the genus. All right, then comes publication time. So once the manuscript is ready, I suggest you put it in a drawer for a week and go do anything else. <laughs> Don't think about the description of the new species for a week, then come back, take it and revise it again fix it because you'll find things to fix after a week and then send to a more experienced ichthyologist friend for review ask a friend ichthyologist to review your paper before submitting to a journal they will find other other problems that you haven't you haven't found after that submit to the journal and wait for the peer review peer review will come with many suggestions for you again then revise the manuscript and resubmit and cross your fingers, soon you'll be author of a new species. Okay, so you see, this is not a simple task. Describing new species required training, understanding of taxonomy, nomenclature, and a very good knowledge about the genus that species belong. So it's not a trivial um, work as many can think. So describing a new species can be a simple publication, but the word work behind it is very, very uh, large and sometimes very time consuming and requires experience. Okay, but you have to begin sometime, right? So I'll thank you.